Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Sejal Davla, Assistant Science Editor for The Sciences, and I will be moderating our discussion. Today our speaker, August Estabrook, will discuss how to identify glycoconjugates on different cell surfaces using plant lectins and immunofluorescence, unraveling new cellular mysteries. We like our webinars to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and our speaker will address these during the Q&A session following the presentation. To ask a question, simply click on the Q&A tab and type your query into the question box located on the right side of your screen. The webinar will be archived on the scientist website, and we will send you the link via email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor, Vector Laboratories. Our sponsor has provided us with some helpful resources related to today's webinar, and we have posted these in our handout section located on the right side of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, let me introduce our speaker. August Estabrook is a senior scientist at Vector Laboratories. Estabrook received his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara in biochemistry with a focus on enzymology. Since then, Estabrook worked at multiple companies and startups, including starting a company during his postdoctoral training. Estabrook has extensive knowledge and experience in protein characterization and assay development that allowed him to both support and lead the development of a plethora of products in a variety of fields. Dr. Estabrook, please take it away. Thank you, Sejal, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us on our webinar today. We will be discussing how to get started with glycan screening, and in particular, how it may be instrumental in your own research into glycosylation. On the agenda for today, we're gonna to take a quick look at some of the fundamental aspects of glycans. We will talk about the lectin selection that you can use to evaluate specific glycans. It will go into some of the details on how to use immunofluorescence to examine glycan expression. We'll briefly look at some steps you can take to help optimize your protocol. And then we'll do, uh, we'll take a quick look at a case study um, of where they've actually used glycan screening for to make um, some discoveries. Okay, so what are glycans? Glycans are a fundamental class of macromolecule uh, that is made up of monosaccharide uh, units. Um, these are polymers, and I have on the right a, a cartoon that can show some of the ways that these monomers are linked together to form these complex structures. Uh, they are cartooned in circles and shapes, and you can see the monomers at the bottom and the larger branch structures up above. And we'll go into more detail those in those uh, in a little bit. So I want to point out that glycosylation is really ubiquitous in life, and it is found in all living cells. Glycans can exist in a free in solution or attached to proteins, lipids, and recently it was discovered uh, RNA molecules can also be glycosylated. So protein glycosylation is probably the most studied aspect of glycosylation. And it's a very common post-translational modification, very similar to phosphorylation or other uh, modifications of translated proteins. And in the same sense that a protein structure dictates its local function, 
its glycosylation can dictate its role under more global settings or in specific cellular functions. And when we talk about protein glycosylation, there's really two ways that glycans are attached to proteins, which I've shown here. On the top are the N-linked glycosylation pathways, where the glycan is attached to the nitrogen atom of asparagine. And there's O-linked glycosylation, which is attached to the oxygen atom of serine or threonine. And as you can see from these cartoon structures, because the polymers are branched, uh, that has made them more complex than, say, linear polymers, such as proteins or nucleic acids. And that, while that might make, might make them a little tougher to study, it makes them a very information-rich medium by which biology can use it to pass on information. And it's also important to appreciate that some of the changes in glycosylation patterns can be very uh, instrumental in understanding specific diseases, in particular the type of glycosylation, the distribution, or even the quantity of glycans on specific markers um, can really impact its biology. So let's, let's look a little closer at <clears throat> glycan's role in biology. In general, glycosylation uh, can be considered one of the languages that cells use to communicate. As sort of cartoon in this drawing, you can see up here a, car a glycan binding protein interacting with a glycan on, a no on another cell. And in this way, the cells are able to pass on information that allows them to work in concert. It is also a means by which pathogens can uh, pick which cell type to invade, or uh, it can even be used in specific diseases such as cancer or some of the autoimmune diseases where specific diseased cells will adjust their glycosylation patterns, uh, usually to an avoid an immune response. So that's kind of the mimicry. And uh, glycans can also be used in, in biology as structural supports or scaffolding and for energy storage. So as we look a little closer at glycans, there are really about eight to 10 predominant monosaccharide building blocks, which are shown here on the left. So I know there's a lot of structures here, so don't worry, don't fall asleep. I'll try and walk you through it. Um, but mostly is what we wanna try and convey is how these specific shapes and colors, the blue circle for glucose, the yellow circle for galactose, et cetera, et cetera, are used to denote these differences um, because it really helps simplify um, the researcher's ability to communicate about these structures. Because if you look very closely, the only difference really between the glucose and the galactose is this single OH group at the chiral center. So the structural differences between these molecules is really very subtle. Um, in addition, if we look over on the right side, the way that these monomers are linked together is critical to understanding their structure. Um, so on the right, you can see the cartoon version here has um, similar composition as this one. However, the linkages between the two, the orientations are different. I think it's easy to appreciate with all the OH groups on the monosaccharides that the number of possibilities or the number of conformers that these molecules can exist in is quite large. So one of the aspects of the branching of glycans that is lost is how they're linked. 
when you simplify them into the cartoon. So if we look closely here, this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six is linked to this monomer via carbon one. So this linkage is a one six. Whereas now over here, we'll start carbon one, two, three, four is linked via carbon one. Oops, sorry, via carbon one over here. And so in that way, this is a one four linkage. So the diversity of the number of structures that these polymers can form is, is really quite large. As we continue to examine glycan complexity, there are a few aspects that are critical to appreciate. In particular, these molecules are not encoded directly in the genome in the same way that proteins or nucleic acids have uh, a template by which you know how to make them, essentially a recipe, glycans still don't have, we, or we still don't have a complete understanding of how that recipe is, is created or translated. So between the flexibility of, of glycans and the fact that they can also be modified themselves, either phosphorylated, sulfated, acetylated. Uh, the number of potential structures that can exist is extremely large. And um, basically between the flexibility of the molecule and the abundance of the potential structures, it's actually not easy to make a protein that can bind to these molecules. So the answer that evolution has found to address this uh, is lectins. So what are lectins? Lectins are essentially glycan binding proteins. They have the ability to recognize and bind to specific glycans. In fact, some people would even argue that the discovery of plant lectins uh, empowered the field of glycobiology to be born. Plant lectins are also abundant all around us. In fact, some of the lectins uh, that we use commonly are from things like tomato plants or daffodils or even potato. You might be eating a lectin right now in your salad and you might not even know that. Um, plant lectins are also um, extremely well characterized. Uh, there are over 100,000 publications on lectins alone. And lectins are usually referred to by a three-letter acronym. And this acronym is derived from the Latin name of the root material that it was isolated from. As an example, GNL lectin is derived from Galanthus nivalis. Um, and given what we just discussed about glycan, the abundance of the number of glycan structures, each lectin actually binds a, a family or a class of glycans. And in that way, plant lectins have basically eight major classes of specificity that we will uh, discuss. The eight major specificities for plant lectins are mannose, complex N-glycan, core O-glycan, fucose, silic acid and sulfation, gluconac and chitin, galactose and lacnac, and galnac. It is important for researchers to fully appreciate the target molecules that they are detecting. And by understanding the nature of these epitopes that are being investigated, you can really gain a much greater appreciation of its broader biological context and the roles that it, it plays in those. Okay, so how are these specificities determined? The specificity groups that were shown on the previous slide uh, were mostly determined using machine learning and glycan arrays. Uh, this is the most robust and thorough method to determine specificity for a lectin, uh, but it can also be labor intensive and expensive. And so 
um, Vector has already characterized the majority of our lectins in, in this way. It can also show you the specific groups of glycans that a lectin will bind. And uh, what is cartooned here in the picture is in the array, there's all these little spots. Those are essential. Each one is a different and unique glycan, which is further cartooned over here. So with a single array, you can apply your lectin solution to it. And by measuring the fluorescence at each spot, you now know roughly or fairly precisely what its affinity is for that specific glycan. And this is predominantly done by NCFG, which is the National Consortium of Functional Glycomics. And um, they have a lot of resources and information available if the exact specificity of a lectin is something that you would like to know more about. I believe this is also a good time to address one of the rumors that lectins are not specific uh, binders to their targets. And I think that that is really far from the truth. And I think a lot of those conclusions are derived from binding studies on lectins with monosaccharides, just the single monomers. So that doesn't really represent the true biological molecules that these proteins interact with. And uh, you can really think of the lectin-glycan interaction as being nearly synonymous to an antigen-antibody interaction. And we'll look at that a little closer on the next slide. So how are you going to use lectins uh, in your research? So really, as I alluded to in the previous slide, it's nearly identical to antibody-based workflows. In the antibody modality shown on the left, you have your tissue sample with an antigen that you're interested in. The first thing you do is apply your primary antibody that recognizes that antigen. You then apply a dye-labeled secondary antibody that recognizes your primary antibody. And in this way, the dye-labeled molecule is now associated with your antigen that you're interested in, and you can basically see that antigen. In the glycobiology world, it's very similar. You have your tissue sample with a glycan target that you're interested in. Instead of anti adding a primary antibody, you add your biotinylated lectin. The biotin is shown here in purple. After that, you add a dye labeled streptavidin. And in that way, you now again are able to have a dye connected to your glycan target, essentially enabling you to visualize where and basically how much of that, or that glycan is present in your sample. So with that, I would like to introduce the Glycite Scout, which is a comprehensive kit that we have developed for glycan screening. In particular, uh, we have curated the lectin panel that is included in uh, for analysis. There are eight lectins, one for each mm, glycan specificity type. And the kit will include all of the ancillary reagents that will be needed for a complete immunofluorescence workflow. In addition, the kit comes in three different colors so that you can match your, your detection modality with the instrument that you'll be using to make uh, the fluorescence, to measure and image the fluorescence. So in a little more detail of how you would actually use this, on the right, we have cartooned a tissue sample with four different glycans on it. By taking your tissue sample and staining it with the Glycite Scout reagents, uh, you essentially will be able to light up specific glycans, which I'm showing below, depending on the specificity of that lectin 
and the specific glycan. In this example here, MAL2, which is a lectin, which recognizes silic acid, which is shown here in the purple diamond. In this way, only this glycan would be stained in your tissue sample, while these other glycans would not. In that same sense, GNL, which is a mannose binder, would identify or light up this glycan, while the others would not have a um, signal. Also in this way, because there are eight lectins included in the kit, you actually sort of have eight different stories. Each glycan and lectin are gonna tell you a different story. It also by taking the kit in a whole, because one lectin is from each of the glycan bins, you will basically have a very broad view of the glycosylation changes in your system. So what I sort of alluded to on the previous slide, we have the eight major glyc glycan binding specificity shown on the left. And on the right, I've identified the specific lectin that is included in the kit. And I'm sure you can see that there is one lectin from each of the major specificities. And I feel that this is really valuable um, because there are a lot of options in terms of which lectin to use. And there's clearly a lot of different glycans in biology. So by Vector Labs having curated this panel for you, uh, hopefully that overwhelming aspect of trying to decide where what assays to run is is simplified and and done for you. Okay, let's get into how you will actually be detecting glycan expression using immunofluorescence. So, as I mentioned before, the kit has been optimized already to provide the optimal signal to noise. And that can really be valuable to save the time and reagents you'd need for an optimization. The kit uh, has been tested on both human and mouse tissue, including FFPE. And it has also been tested on uh, many different organ types. Something else you can do with the kit that can be very powerful is dual labeling or double labeling. In this way, perhaps you have uh, your favorite marker uh, that you use to examine uh, your, your tissues on a regular basis. And you want to investigate or understand how glycosylation changes in relation to your favorite marker. Essentially, you can stain both your antibody and uh, the lectins simply by picking different colors. So in these images, we've stained uh, the tissue with both a lectin and a primary antibody, AE1, AE3. So these images are of a colon carcinoma and AE1, AE3 is a pan cytokeratin marker, and it is shown in green. The blue staining is DAPI, which shows cellular nuclei, and the red staining is from the specific lectin. On the left, it's ECL lectin, and on the right, PHAL. So by combining the lectin staining with the antibody staining, you can now gain additional information in regard to spatial orientation of certain glycosylation, as shown here, like in relation to tumor microenvironments. Um, but you can also use it to help give you insight into the glycosylation around that specific marker that you've chosen. Okay, so how, how will we optimize the protocol? I've already told you that we've done a lot of the optimization for you, 
but there are a few aspects uh, that users should keep in mind when running their protocol. So first, let's take a bit of a deeper look into how the workflow actually uh, looks. So there is less than two hours of incubations and you start with your tissue sample and you add the streptavidin block for 10 minutes. You follow that. The streptavidin block is important to sequester any endogenous biotin that may be in your tissue. You follow that with 10 minutes of a biotin blocking solution that then sequesters any streptavidin sites that may still be available from your streptavidin block. You follow that with the carbo-free block, which is diluted from the 10x version that we provide in the kit. So you dilute it down to 1x and apply it to your sample for 30 minutes. You then apply your biotinated lectin. Follow that with streptavidin dye. And after that, you're essentially ready to mount and cover slip your tissue and image it. So the steps a user will want to optimize on their own because each system will be somewhat unique. Every tissue sample is a little different. The glycan expression within that sample can be very different. So we encourage uh, researchers to experimentally optimize each of these aspects. The first uh, would be antigen retrieval or antigen unmasking. And this is essentially a um, usually a heat treatment to your tissue to liberate epitopes that may be occluded. Some 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 tissue types uh, and uh, glycans that you're trying to interrogate won't need this process, and so we encourage uh, users to examine that. And in, there are various reagents and resources on Vector Lab's website that can help identify reagents that might be valuable for some of these steps and uh, webinars and really a lot of resources to help you optimize. Next would be streptavidin and biotin blocking. Not all samples will require this and again should be experimentally determined. Third would be the titration of the biotinated lectin. So we have optimized and recommended a specific range uh, to dilute the lectin in. But as I said before, because each tissue sample and, and glycosylation expression is different, it might be worth optimizing that aspect in your overall workflow. Finally, autofluorescence is a, a common problem when doing IF. Essentially, some tissue types automatically fluoresce even when no dyes or detection systems are, are added to the system. And that can obviously be problematic because you'll be getting signal thinking it's your glycan or your epitope when really it's just background fluorescence. So again, I would encourage you, if you encounter any of these issues or need optimization, uh, the website, our Vector Labs website, has an abundance of resource, resources and reagents you can use to help. OK, now let's get to some of the fun stuff. Let's see how people are using glycan screening in the real world. And in the study we're going to look at today, um, they essentially are looking for biomarkers. And I believe that this is a, uh, a common application that the screening kit can be used for. And it can be really quite powerful. So the title is Lectins as Biomarkers of ICBPS Disease, a Comparative Study of Glycosylation Patterns in human pathological urothelium and ICBPS experimental models. The author, the study was led by Dr. Ehrman at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. And 
in the abstract was uh, a sentence that I felt very well captured some of the potential of glycan screening. They say, studying changes in tissue glycosylation patterns under pathological conditions is a promising way of discovering novel biomarkers and therapeutic targets. So they've really tried to emphasize that using glycan screening, that there are there is the potential for the discovery of novel biomarkers. And I think that that's really quite critical. There is also the notion that glycosylation represents the last frontier of biology that is uh, ripe for discovery. In particular, proteins, DNA, RNA, those are very prominent in biology and also very heavily studied. Glycosylation is really just as prominent, but not as studied as much. And hence, there's really a lot of opportunity there. So before we look at their data, let's uh, understand a little bit more some of the vocabulary. So the disease that they are looking at is ICBPS, that's interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome. And the, one of the main reasons um, that they probably went after this uh, disease is it can be very difficult for clinicians to diagnose it. There are a lot of competing symptoms and there haven't been a whole lot of good biomarkers for this disease. And that has led uh, the authors to try and rectify that aspect. ICBPS is prevalent at roughly one in 10,000 people. So let's look at what they did. This is a schematic of their, of their study. On the left, you see three different types of samples they collected, human bladders, mouse bladders, and uh, a RT4 cell line, which they can culture, and uh, those are human urothelial cells. The two bladders, both the human and the mouse bladders are then paraffined, embedded, and sectioned to basically mount it on a little slide. You then perform histochemistry and cytochemistry, followed by fluorescent microscopy. And for the cell lines over here, they basically seed them onto 96 well plates, perform similar histochemistry and cytochemistry, and they use this system to make measurements on the fluorescence intensity to basically quantify the amount of glycans on those cells. In their study, they used a panel of 10 fluorescine labeled lectins, which I'm showing here. Uh, they did combine the staining in a dual label modality, like what we just discussed, with the AUM antibody. The AUM antibody is used to confirm that the cells you're looking at are truly urothelium cells. And the table on the right summarizes the lectin name, the three letter or the abbreviation that is commonly used to refer to that lectin, the specific monosaccharide specificity, and uh, also a bit more about the complex glycan types that it recognizes in a biological system. And then on the far right, uh, the vendor and, and part number. And you'll notice that these lectins were all selected from a different uh, screening kit that we have for lectins, um, FLK2100 there. And they've also substituted or added in a few other lectins that they believe uh, might have a lot of relevance for their system. So let's look at their data. So <clears throat> there's a lot of information here, but let's walk through it. 
Um, section A, you have your control human and your disease human. This is sort of representative of the current modalities by which a pathological assessment could be made. And in particular, they're gonna focus on this region up here and they call them the SC, which is the superstitial cells, the IC, the intermediate cells, and the BC are the basal cells. Now, when they do fluorescent microscopy on these samples, the AUM column shown here in column one, uh, you see the red staining to validate that these tissue samples are indeed urothelial cells. The second column is the healthy human, and the third column is the disease state human sample. And you can see here that uh, the green staining represents the lectin with each row being a different lectin, WGA, Jaclyn, DSL, Con A. And they're essentially looking for both differences in uh, spatial location, which they capture here, and fluorescence intensity, which they capture here. One of the main conclusions that they um, got from the human samples here is that there was a statistically relevant change in the fluorescence intensity of Jaclyn staining on these samples. And in this way, uh, they, they may have, they, they have essentially discovered a potential biomarker. They kind of repeat the same thing on the mouse tissue, um, but at looking at these images on the right and the bar graphs here in D, uh, you can see that there's actually perhaps more uh, changes in the mouse model than in the human model. In general, they have a lot. Uh, in fact, all four of these lectins show statistically relevant changes in intensity. And it's also noticeable that even kind of globally, the glycosylation pattern seems to be lower in the disease state. So from this study, they were basically successfully able to identify potential new biomarkers for the ICBPS disease. They definitely found statistically relevant changes in intensity and location that seem to correlate with the disease state that they're interested in. And they were able to make recommended improvements to the current methods of diagnosis for this disease. And I took a sentence here from their discussion. We therefore suggest that a combination of quantitative analysis of Jaclyn binding and qualitative assessment of WGA binding could be used as additional methods for histopathological diagnosis of ICBPS in patients. So hopefully with uh, this information now, you, you have a better understanding of how glycobiology might be impacting your system. Hopefully you have more confidence in your decisions on how to interrogate that. And now you also have a, a kit that would be perfect to help get you started. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. And if there are any questions, uh, I'm available. Thank you, Dr. S. W. for that wonderful presentation. As a reminder to the audience, you can submit your questions at any point during the webinar. Um, we have several questions already, so let's get to them. Um, I think let's um, talk about the kit itself. How was the curated lectin panel selected for the glycide kit? Uh, so that's a good question. Anytime you make a kit that has a curated panel, you'll you'll obviously inherently upset some people because their favorite lectin is not included. Right. So we did our best, of course, to pick a very broad set. Uh, we did a lot of literature searching. 
um, to look at which lectins and glycan types are being studied. We examined it, how it might be field specific. And then we took our selection and uh, ran it by a few key opinion leaders to get their recommendations and um, blessings. And from that, that is how we landed on the specific lectins that we included in the kit. Thank you, Dr. Estabrook. So let's say, you know, we have audience members and their favorite uh, lectin is missing. Could they just build their own panel? So you can build your own panel. There, there's an abundance of lectins to choose from. But one of the value aspects of this kit is it has all the components you'll need uh, for the complete workflow. So it has all the ancillary reagents, your, your blocking solutions, the protocols have been optimized. It should really be a very much of a plug and play modality. Uh, that said, for the more experienced users, and like what we saw in the case study, you can supplement it with additional lectins that you feel may might be relevant and that is uh, definitely something that that is very doable thank you dr estabrook it's a, another set of questions which is mostly you know interesting how can i verify the specificity of lectin staining in the tissue sample of my interest so there's a there's some interest in the bone tissue sections, whether this would work for plant cells or, um, you know, for uh, brain cells and uh, in different parts of cell organelles. So uh, I think there was a few questions in there. So basically we have, you know, tested this kit on the tissues that we, that we mentioned, human and mouse, which are probably the most prominent. Uh, that said, lectin staining is done in, a, in many different modalities. Uh, you, even maybe flow cytometry, you can use it in different types of tissue samples that we haven't necessarily tested here. And to get started there, you can either search through the literature um, or you can reach out to our tech support. Uh, again, on our website, we have a lot of resources to help uh, guide that sort of decision of what what lectin do I pick for my system? So I think that was one of the questions. And then let me briefly touch on uh, how you confirm in your exact system the specificity of the staining. Uh, there are a few classic tricks there. One of them is you can pre-incubate your lectin with an inhibiting sugar. And in that way, you're, you will ablate any staining from that lectin. You can perhaps treat your tissue sample with an enzyme that might remove that glycan. PNGase F is a very common enzyme used to remove you know, almost all N glycans. Uh, and again, that process uh, will also ablate your, your staining from the lectin. And so in that way, um, you, each user has a way to validate their results uh, with their system, which I think can be very valuable. So in that instance, what could be some of the ideal controls? So some of the controls I think are pretty much similar to the controls you'd include in antibody staining. So you really wanna make sure you don't have autofluorescence. So you basically have one section that has none of the detection reagents added. Uh, that'll basically then if there's stuff glowing in your sample, it's not from the staining. And so that would need to be addressed. Uh, we have again, multiple products like TrueView and such on our website that uh, can really help with some of those issues. Other controls to run would be to exclude your lectin. So to see if there's any background staining from, uh, from your detection modalities. Um, so those are some of the, the classic controls that a user should run. Uh, so I think uh, we have a question on plant cells and I think in the context of autofluorescence, 
Do you have any experience that, you know, you tend to have more auto autofluorescence if working with plant tissues compared to the animal tissues? And what are some of the troubleshooting that uh, um, the experimenter need to know? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I have the best answer for you, uh, and they're happy to, uh, we can happily follow up after this to uh, speak with the tech support about that. But in general, um, you know, autofluorescence can be a fairly common uh, problem that you'll encounter anytime you do immunofluorescence. Um, some of our reagents are, are really good at solving that. So it's, even though it's a common problem, I'd sort of say it's usually a fairly easy solution um, in terms of plants versus, you know, animal tissue. Most, I would sort of say that tissues like brain uh, with lipofusion can be some of the more autofluorescing types of tissues, um, but it's specific, comparisons between plants and animals, I, I would probably defer to uh, follow up with you afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Estabrook. Um, you did mention flow cytometry application. So how does the kit work for that? Uh, well, we haven't directly tested um, the kit in flow cytometry, but uh, lectin staining is very common in flow. And in theory, this kit may still be the ideal kit for someone who's just getting into it, uh, into trying to interrogate glycosylation in their system. Um, the only subtlety is that, yeah, you probably won't need the mounting media because you're not putting things on a slide. But other than that, um, and we don't, and you won't have optimized protocols, but like I said, lectin staining is, is quite, quite common in flow and uh, should definitely be doable. Thank you. I have another audience question. Does the specificity of lectins that you have shown in, in the table, is it towards the terminal structures or is it in the internal structure or, or it, it's all relate, relative? Yeah, it's all, so there's some of both. Um, you know, some of the fucose binders, they bind the core fucose. There's also terminal fucose lectins. Uh, so, you know, I, I would sort of say that it's really sort of glycan and lectin specific. And when we curated that panel, uh, we didn't necessarily pay attention too much as to where that glycan epitope was. It's more about that that glycan has a biological relevance and we have a way to detect it. Thank you. Um, so maybe talking about, uh, you know, other lectins, are there any other mannose binders? Could this be extrapolated to other kind of lectin applications? So that's a good question. And um, I can actually expand on that a little bit. So. The short answer is yes, there are other lectins that bind mannose, uh, but the story is a little bigger than that. So each lectin is gonna be unique. And hopefully from the talk, you've seen how mannose can be, be in many different conformers and structures. And in that way, uh, you might have a lot of variety in the glycan structure that has biological relevance that needs to be interrogated by a different lectin that represent that can bind these other structures. So when somebody says, are there other lectins that bind mannose? There are many lectins that bind mannose, but they also aren't all going to be the same. Right. Um, and perhaps we can end with this one last question, but let's say we have some audience members, they are new to glycan screening. Are there any resources uh, that could help them get started? Um, as I've mentioned a few times, definitely that uh, Vector Labs has, we have webinars, we have white papers, uh, there's even select publications. There's, there's really a lot of resources on our website. And I would really encourage you to call tech support. Uh, they're, they're pretty much always available. 
and uh, can really be very helpful and instrumental in getting you started and to hit the ground running. Great. Thank you, Dr. Estabrook, for, for these insightful answers. For our audience members, if you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to our speaker directly. Their contact is shown on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the scientist website and you will receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I would again like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today and particularly those of you who shared their comments and questions. On behalf of the scientists, I would, I would also like to thank our speaker, Dr. August Estabrook, as well as our sponsor, Vector Laboratories. Thank you everyone and goodbye.